meeting of the zoning commission, Simsbury Zoning Commission, to order. Um, what do we got? Uh, we're missing Donna, right? Yes. I, I don't know if somebody, Sandy Stevens or something, is waving his hands. You're on He's mute. on mute. He's on mute. You. Anyway, um, but we will have to appoint one alternate, I believe. One, two, three. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Three, four, Excellent. Five. Sorry about that. Okay. So who hasn't been an alternate in a while? Well, we only have two choices, it's Diane or Shannon. Shannon, I think, was an alternate last time. So, Diane, would you sit for Donna? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the first order of business is the approval of minutes for the June 7th meeting. Anybody have any comments or corrections? Dave, I read the minutes and I... I didn't find anything needing correction, so I'll move that they be accepted as they were submitted. Okay, is there a second? Second. By Kevin, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstained? Okay, six, nothing, it carries. Okay, the first order of, uh, of business tonight is a uh, public hearing of the Simsbury Zoning Commission. Could our vice chairman read the call? Yeah, I got to get back to that now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, be my honor to read it if uh, Kevin would like a, an assist. Yeah, I, I got it. I just was on the minutes instead of the... All right, application number 21-11 of the Simsbury Zoning Commission applicant for text amendment to section 5.3 dimensional requirements and section 5.5 permitted and specially permitted uses in the industrial zoning districts of the zoning requirement of uh, regulations. Great, thank you. Um, we have uh, an opportunity for the commissioners to ask questions if they have any comments about this. I think we should not, we should be aware of what it is. Anybody have any comments or questions? Um, is there any? I think we did a great job on it. <laughs> Mike did a great job. Any anybody in the public who wants to speak to this um, to this application? Going once, <laughs> going twice. I guess no one no one is uh, going to speak up. We have not received any communications, have we, Mike? No, that's correct. We, we did not receive anything from uh, the public. We do, you do have the two referrals that we received from the Planning Commission, finding it consistent with the Plan of Conservation Development, and also from the Capital Regional Council of Governments, finding it uh, consistent with the Plan of Conservation Development for the region. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more public comment? Okay, we can uh, close the public hearing, I believe. All right, I move we close the public hearing. Second it. Second by Mike Doyle. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. We have a six nothing. We close the public hearing. Okay, let's go on to uh, the next application 2112. Kevin, could you read the call for that public hearing? Please. Yep. Uh, number 20, application uh, number 2112 of 22G, 22GC uh, 2012 LLC, Andreo, um, Andreo Family Enterprises owner Daniel Stevens applicant for special exception pursuant to section 4.6B uh, for a full liquor license for a new restaurant in the former Dunkin' Donuts location at the property located at 828 Hot Meadow Street, Andy's Plaza, Assessor's Map H09, Lot 227, Lot 001A, and 1B, Zone, zone uh, SE1. Thank you. Um, the commissioners, anyone have some any questions about this application? 
is strictly for a full liquor list, ah, full liquor permit for what will be a um, Mexican restaurant, I believe. Yeah, is it clear exactly what where they're looking at? I, mean, I assume that they wanted it out on the sidewalk as well. There's a diagram, Kevin. There's a floor plan, and actually, the applicants here too to speak to uh, the application. If you have any questions, uh, hi guys, thanks for meeting. Appreciate it. Yeah, so it's a it's a to go driven Mexican concept. There'll be um, we wanted to create a bar atmosphere, put a little small bar in, and have the option to have the cocktails outside with limited seating. Um, I thought it would be a great idea to have some good tacos with with some good margaritas attached to it. So that's kind of how it all started. It was originally just going to be a to go, and then as the architect we looked at it, it just it just it it just called for it. I thought it would be a great move for us. So that's where we kind of proceeded in this in this area, and um, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. So that's like interesting. There's not going to be, oh, I'm sorry. There's not going to be a sit down restaurant. It's going to be a two go. There is. No, there oh. is. There'll be 28 seats inside and then oh. we'll have the bar and then we'll have limited seating outside. How many we could seat outside? I don't know. I mean, I thought we'd put six tables of, um, of four, um, but I don't know the process as far as knowing how many people I can actually put out there. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessarily relevant to the question. Um, to the okay. Curious. Yep. No, okay. just that the, the liquor permit has to have the patio option right yeah gotcha well it has to be i thought it, it had to be defined area though there's no fencing around it or anything it's just showing i mean i did see the diagram but it doesn't show anything no about... there's there'll be some planters and stuff in front but they're um the tables will be sitting freely out there um but they're they're i don't think there's any plan of having fencing out, out, out where that area is I thought it just had to be identified. I don't think it has to be, you know, completely separate. Well, it, it used to be, and I, I somehow it's gotten liberalized. But I know, you know, back when we did Antonio's, they had to have a fence around it and had to be, you know, we were very so specific about how they had to designate the liquor, the, uh, the liquor area. Same with uh, the, um, the, the pub, Redstone Pub. So, um, so Ke Kevin, the, the previous... Um, Consumer protection regulations for liquor licenses required a four foot tall barrier right. around the perimeter. Since then, consumer protection has exactly what you said, they, they've laxed those standards. And they did that without telling communities. So, you know, the plant, they've allowed people to use planters versus a fence around it. Um, they've allowed a more lenient approach depending on uh, existing site conditions. Um, so we, we've we've seen we've seen a varying degree of of let's call them barrier barrier protection around uh, outdoor seating areas that have been approved, which are not just a simple fence around the perimeter. And okay, they, cool. they they have unfortunately they've not given towns like a real guidance of this is what we really want to see. Uh, what what Mike said earlier, uh, Mike Doyle, the where they just really want to see where's the patio. That's that's kind of the direction we're getting from the state now. Where's the patio? Okay, thank you. Okay, oh. then do they need to limit it to the one, two, three, four, five, six tables? Or why couldn't they go further down that sidewalk towards where the liquor store is, or further towards uh, the super, the old supermarket? I mean, are we limiting it by submitting this plan? Are they limited to six tables, or could they actually do more? Like they're limited to what they showed consumer protection so this would this would this this layout with the six tables would be what they're limited to uh, mr stevens has has he submitted this already has the applicant submitted this already to to consumer protection um i don't no i don't believe i have i've, I've submitted the zoning form i didn't i didn't realize um you know, you need you need our approval before you can submit it. Right. So I'm just saying, you know, why are we limiting it to those six tables when he, there's room there that's not particularly utilized? There's not a whole lot of pedestrian travel on that sidewalk. What does his what does his leasehold say? Um, you know, he's obviously limited inside the building, but what about the outside? 
Well, there's a there's another business that's opening up there in the middle. They're redoing the whole plaza, so they plan on having full occupancy all there. So I'm I'm limited to the to the area that I'm paying rent to. Um, so um, I thought that the six tables was right in that zone. Um, that's all I really know on that situation. And doesn't the outdoor stuff have to come back to you, Mike? At least in the current um, environment. Yeah. Yeah, they they'll they'll come to us. Uh, well, they're gonna get they they'll they'll need either my signature or Laura's signature for the application for the consumer protection, and then we've been kind of working with the restaurants on any outdoor any changes to their setup outside if it's on a temporary basis. Yeah, so that's it doesn't say anywhere here it's temporary. No, this is their permanent patio. Yeah, that's this. It's two different things. They're here for their the permanent approval for the liquor license, both indoors and outdoors, for this uh, future restaurant. But what you're telling us is you have no guidance on how much of the sidewalk can be covered by the tables and chairs. Whatever he draws, he can have. Wow, that's what liquor control. Yeah, like like I said years ago, it used to be. You need a barrier, four foot tall fence around the perimeter. Now they're lenient. So if we were to if we yeah. were to give him an approval for up to six or seven or eight tables outside, um, that would allow you to constrain his his operation to his property. Did that work? Dan, are you What's okay that? with that? Pardon? Yeah, yeah, it, that's what it takes, sure, yep. But it would have to define it as four tops and <laughs> right. all of those things. Kevin? I was thinking six six tables of four, six tables of four, that was what I was kind of thinking. Well, we're hoping they're more successful than that and you need. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> I, well, Especially on that on the side of the property there. I mean, there's yeah. nothing there. I mean, if you guys can do something there, why not? No, I know. I'm I'm very excited to get started, sir. Very there's excited. There's parking there. Wait a minute. There's parking there. No, there's a there's a walkway. The walkway. Covered walkway. I know, but adjacent to the park walkway is the parking. Right. Yeah. Right. Hmm. There's well, a head in parking spot right in that corner. Yeah, in the corner there is, but you you've got space down there. But there's a okay, lot of so right just now. let me make sure I understand this. There's no approval yet by anything like the health department, the fire department, the police, and, and there, nobody's seen this except the zoning commission. No, Is I've I've correct? had it signed off. I, I I got all the signatures I need. The only two signatures I needed was from the zoning. I went to the fire department and I, I've got those, and this was the last step for me. Hmm. I, I notified the health department about everything and they said that they couldn't proceed because zoning was in the way. This is, I can't proceed until the zoning is, is heard. So that's kind of where we're at there. Right. It, and the health district's going to be focused on the kitchen layout, yeah. et cetera. They're not really concerned with the outdoor seating, at least from a sense of the, their day-to-day -day regulatory responsibilities. Yeah. I'm trying to get a sense of what our responsibility is here because it seems like not very much as it comes to the restaurant. The, the the use is set because it was a food service business before. So that's not an issue. And we don't have any authority really over the space and the configuration. And, you know, 25 people on the inside or 20 on the inside, 25 on the outside or whatever those numbers are. That's beyond our, our scope. So. But Bruce, we, okay. we have, I think we should define what the area on the outside that he can use is. I mean, that's, we're keeping the neighbors from killing each other by defining where he can go, where he can put tables. So well, of, absent a scale on here, it's hard to tell if that's safe as it's drawn. I mean, I don't know how big those tables and chairs are, or how wide the sidewalk is. I could get with Andy, the owner of the plaza, and I'm sure he can draw out those lines as far as what I'm actually able to use. He, he's not going to let me use that whole sidewalk. I know that. Um, but it was just strictly in front of the windows that are located right there on that corner. And that's where I plan on putting them, just three on in front of those windows and three on the other side. And that's, 
that's it. That's all I plan on doing. Yeah. All right. Well, let's if, go with that. If that's what he wants. Yeah. Let's, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to reinvent the wheel. And, I mean, uh, could we just say that he can, oh, sorry. I was going to say, can we just say he can put tables in within the footprint of the restaurant itself? And then he can figure out how he wants to squeeze them in within that space, like within the exterior. Footprint. Yeah. I'm leased for a certain spot. I'm not going to go outside the zone there. I mean, well, I, yeah, no, but your lease must go all the way back to the back door there. It does. It yeah. does. Yep. And that's where you're not using. Yep. Okay. So I think it's okay for us to tell him that he can use the outdoor space that's in his leasehold agreement right. for tables and let him figure out right. what the tables situation is. Yeah. I, I don't know what to say about it, but, you know, I, did, I, I'm surprised. I didn't realize that a lease document would define for somebody in that location what the spaces on the sidewalk they could have tables. But I've never seen a lease for a restaurant anyway, so I don't know that much about it. But if they, you know, if we want to just make up some wordage and tack it onto the approval, that's fine with me. Uh, I it think turns out to be somehow at loggerheads with the lease. Or the interests of the other people in the in the you know in the building. Um, that's not our problem. Well, we could we could say he could put them wherever the owner decides is okay. Right. I mean, Andy decides. Well, we could just say we're, we'll approve what he submitted and. If the landlord won't let them do it, then they can work it out or come back to the zoning commission to ask for something else. Okay. 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 Any comments from the commissioners? Any from the general public? I don't see anybody from the public here. Mike, do we receive any uh, correspondence on this application? No, we had, no, we did not. Okay. Um, I guess we could close the public hearing. Yeah, then I move that we close the public hearing on 20, 2112 application. I'll second it. Second by Mike Doyle. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Carries 6 nothing. So it's closed. Okay, the next application is the uh, next business is the application 2111 of Simsbury Zoning Commission applicant for text amendment. Um, as uh, defined in our attachments. Um, any comments on, uh, Mike has given us a uh, recommended uh, motion for this. Anybody have any comments on that? The only thing I would say, and we talked about this, is when we publish it, that on the uh, dimensions one, Mike, that we still put the I-1 ahead of the I-2 instead of the I-2 ahead of the I-1. The nitpick. Didn't yeah. we do that? I thought we fixed. The, yeah, we, we were. The language the, we were, right. Go ahead. The, that will go, that will, you're right. That will go first in the, in the regs. Okay, we have a, um, Where's the uh, staff report? There we are. Okay, if we're ready to make a motion. Doyle wants to make the motion. Can I make a motion. Mike, okay. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve application 2111 of the Simsbury Zoning Commission applicant for a text amendment to section 5.3 dimensional requirements and 5.5 .5 permitted and specially permitted uses in the industrial zoning districts of the zoning regulations. July, uh, dated July 1721 and is, a, is the effective date for the proposed changes in sections 5.3 and 5.5 .5 of the zoning regulations. Okay, a second by anybody? Second. Second, second. second by... Kevin, I'll, I'll give it to Diane. She just We're gonna fight there. Oh, huh? I want my name out there somewhere. Okay, Diane, <laughs> you're for the second then. Mike Doyle and Diane seconded it. 
Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. It carries six nothing. Thank you. Good. That's a good step forward. Um, okay. The next application is the liquor license application 2112. Uh, we did have some discussion of that a few minutes ago. Um, anybody have any further comments or questions? Other than we should just leave it alone and not try to make amendments to, you know, right. the dimensional component of what we were discussing, I would encourage us just to approve it as is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, Mike. Good idea. Okay, that's two for two. Kevin? Uh, well, at this point, it doesn't have any description of where it is. Um, as drawn. Well, it doesn't say as drawn. As submitted, <coughs> but our motion could. It's dated. Our, it's the application of the. But our motion is to let operate. them have a full liquor license and a patio license, and the the uh, state, I think, has some control too, as well as the town. Yep. So at, at, at this point, it just says property located at eight twenty eight Hot Meadow Street. Um, Yes, because it's a part of that property. Yeah. Not the whole thing. Right. But what he can use is between him and Andy and, and, and his banker, I guess. Oh, right. oh, I see. Yeah. So what, what we're approving is what Mike drafted for us. Possibly. Right. Any other comments? Yeah, because let's see, it says for a restaurant in the former Dunkin' Donuts. So it doesn't even say anything about being indoor or outdoor. We should say included patio, right? Well, I, you know, I just don't want to get in, you know, stopped by the state because it's not clear for, you know, our- Yeah, the state can be a stickler on these things. So I would say we should amend the uh, application or the uh, approval to um, full liquor license for a new restaurant and patio in the former Dunkin' Donuts location. How about that? Okay. Okay, Mike, you want to do it again? Sure, why not? We're on a roll. <laughs> We'll find out in a second. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve application 21-12 of 22 GC 2012 LLC, Andrero Family Enterprises, owner, owner Daniel Stevens, applicant for a special exception pursuant to section 4.6B4, a full liquor license for a new restaurant in the former Dunkin' Donuts to include the patio area location at the property located at 828 Hot Meadow Street, Andes Plaza, assessor's map H09 block 227 lot 001A and 1B. The zone is SC-1. The special exception approval is subject to the following condition. An administrative zoning permit is required for the tenant to fill out. Fit out. Fit out, Fit out. excuse me, thank you. Actually, maybe it is supposed to be fill out. Administrative money, isn't it? No, it's, it's fit out. out. Yeah, it's fit out. Yeah. It's fit out. Oh, four. Oh. I second the motion. Or okay. Somebody. Discussion. Oh. Yeah. Okay. No more discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Carry six nothing. Thank you very much. All right, the next application is a Ethel Walker School um, for a site, site, ah, site, site amendment for sign plan. Uh, Mike, did the design review board pass on this? No, this was not uh, on, this was not in front of the design review this evening. So if they just, they're just coming here because, and uh, you have, 
you have a representative from Lauren Signs here. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, I'll introduce okay. myself at this Ready? point. Um, it's Artifact Signs. Right. And my name is Lauren Rosen. And I'm here with Linda Loriano, who manages our permits. Um, we're applying on behalf of the Ethel Walker School uh, for a sign system. Um, it's a sign plan, a unified sign plan for um, approximately 200 acres. And uh, we understand that we exceed the allowance and we're hoping that uh, based on your rulings, um, the commission can consider size, scale, landscaping, supportive sign, et cetera, and relationship to the parcel or parcels. And uh, what we have here is a, a sign system that consists of uh, five perimeter signs and uh, directional signs. Some are direct replacements of previous signs. Some are new signs. Now we recently installed one sign, the main sign, which is on Bushy Hill Road at the main entrance to the school. It's a tavern style sign that has uh, wash lighting built into the stanchion arm, the cross arm. Um, I don't know if you have these pictures in front of you, but I have them here. And if you need me to share the screen, I'm happy to do so. Although it's probably gonna be with Linda's uh, prompting or guidance. Okay, Mike, why don't you let him share the screen and show us what he's talking, what they're talking about. And why is it that it, why is it that it's beyond the limits, Mike? You're muted. Mike, we can't hear you. Sorry, I was stuck on mute. Uh, Lauren could go through all the signs because they, they, the, um, it's number and size that, that they're exceeding. And why don't you, Lauren, as you go through, um, show which ones are exact replacements and which ones are new signs. Um, so question, could you see my screen? Yes, yes we can. Yes. Okay, and right now you're seeing the title page? Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, so as we go through, you have a plan from above. So um, just to go through it, basically, A to reference is on Bushy Hill. This is the sign that was recently installed. Hey, can you explain uh, again how you're doing the lighting on that? I think it's, it's great. You know, I appreciate it. Um, a lot of contemplation. Uh, so what's happened with the signs, it's kind of a, an interesting story. We were called for sign D. Um, an a, alumnus had donated some money for a sign in the corner of Bushy Hill and Sand Hill. And uh, we have a couple of uh, employees here whose children go to Ethel Walker and Hooker by Crook. We started to talk. It developed into the main sign on Bushy Hill. And then from there, they liked it and somehow found some more funds out of uh, the endowment. So. Uh, but, but what are the mechanics of the light? How do you, yeah. you, you I mean, in the yeah. next slide down, so, maybe you have the picture of the, of it lit up. Yeah, I'm gonna get into that. So we started okay. with sign uh, A and sign A, um, and I have some nighttime shots that are Uh, if you look at this style sign, this is sign A, and this is merely a depiction. Um, I should have had the photo that I could call up. So what happens in the crown molding of this sign um, buried inside, there are LED lights that come across in a row that wash light downward and at the same time serve as a backlighting for the 230, the address, which is a stencil cut push through. The sign is actually made out of uh, aluminum and 
the uh, upright and the stanchion arm are also aluminum and PVC. So the lighting is encapsulated in this crown molding, which is also aluminum. There's a lens on the bottom, uh, a polycarbonate, which is sanded and the sanded polycarbonate diffuses the light downward, um, which serves as the wash light. No, the reason I ask is because we're looking at sign regs and if this works, this is a neat way of doing it versus a, a spotlight shining up onto the light. Yeah, we happen to like it and we've been using it for the last uh, maybe half dozen years. We, we have refined it along the way and I was very pleased with this. I lived nearby and came out and I, I think it worked well. Um, so our intention is for the other uh, three stanchion signs, a tavern style, they would be um, exact duplicates. And if I could bring it back to the map. Yeah, thanks. Um, so you saw sign A, you'd go down Bushy Hill headed uh, south to sign B, which is over the stone wall and then around and down Sand Hill to sign C, which is at a main entry, and then also to sign E, which is at a main entry. So what you see with sign A is merely replicated. Sign D is an anomaly, and the only reason being uh, we didn't feel that a tavern style sign was really the appropriate method of approaching this um, brownstone wall. So with that particular piece, and this is actually um, kind of a keynote sign, it's different from the others in that it is um, encapsulated in wrought iron and it will be, um, a sign that's layered using various materials that are comprised of urethanes and acrylics. But being that they're spray painted, the end result will look like a wooden sign with a wrought iron perimeter and also a bracket filigree that ties it in with that wall. Now we tried everything for this wall and the wall, it, it's in okay condition. Um, we looked at it, we put a sign on the front, we put a sign above, we suspended a sign between the two columns and this seemed to work out. And our feeling about this wall would be that it would differ slightly from the other signs in the sense that it would more bring this logo um, to the forefront. So it's kind of a relative of the other four um, perimeter signs. Um, and I know what you're saying about lighting. Unfortunately, with this one, the best we could do would be uh, the proposal of two uh, ground lights, which would light uh, upward and on an angle to wash this piece, which would have dimensional letters around the perimeter and inset background and this dimensional uh, piece in the center. Um, the, the sundial, so you get you get a lot of uh, shadowing and highlighting. And moving through this with the secondary signs, uh, some are direct replacements. So in looking at the campus, which I've looked at for years and years and years, and every time a sign goes up, and it's not so much that I'm in the sign business, I say, boy, I have a good idea for what might be a, a better sign system somewhere in the future. And fortunately, um, they did call and we thought about this long and hard. And it's not that the signs they have right now um, are bad, they're just not fantastic. And our feeling was that this is a first class school. Um, we wanted the sign system to be commensurate with some of the other schools that we've provided sign systems for. This is a little bit different. It's a little more traditional. It's a little more New England rather than uh, prep school or Ivy League. But if you go through it, this is a one-to-one -one replacement. 
Again, this sign is all aluminum in acrylic. When it's sprayed and we use low luster finishes, um, epoxies that are catalyzed that are uh, that have a longevity. It's pretty much like an automotive spray, but we add in matte mediums to uh, tone the gloss way back. So it has the effect of a latex paint or uh, uh, hand painting. So this is a one-to-one -one replacement. This is the main directional as you turn into the uh, campus off of Bushy Hill. Um, as we go through, again, a one-to-one -one replacement. Um, you know, the oval is perfectly fine. Is it great? Um, it's a matter of opinion. The problem is the signs are somewhat mismatched and we wanted to come in with a uniform system. So it was easy to tie this in with the main signs. So there's some type of hierarchy that kind of pervades through the entire system. So as you come through, um, this is the main, or um, I'm sorry, this is a secondary. Another secondary. Now this, if you see, there's nothing here right now. And we walked the campus, we listened, we identified areas that were queuing points and designed signs that were six square feet to identify um, different areas of the complex, a directional sign, if you will. So this is a sub-directional sign. As you come through another sub-directional, nothing there right now, proposed six square feet. It's an identical sign. As you come through similar situation, there's nothing there now. Um, six square foot sign matching ensemble. One-to-one um, -one replacement, kind of getting rid of this candy cane look in favor of, again, a tavern style sign. Um, it's approximately uh, four square feet. Uh, these are a new class of signs that match this tavern style sign and they identify the individual buildings very, very similar to what we um, have done at other schools. I should have had an example here of one we just did at Hopkins uh, Prep School down in New Haven. I interrupt you again. Is New Dorm the official name? Um, no. All right. I, it's just it's just a holding. It's a placeholder. placeholder? Okay. And I I think there's an intention uh, for a build here, but we wanted to get this all on one plan instead of coming back in two or three years to say, listen, here's an addition to what we already have promised you to be a finite system. Okay. Uh, window lettering, which is essentially just vinyl letters cut in reverse. And then we have um, for the playing fields a matching tavern style sign. Uh, there is a single stake sign, a double sided sign that talks about uh, rules and regulations. Uh, the playing fields. Um, Linda just told me as a replacement, the rules and regs are a replacement. No, yep, not that one, but just a tavern. Like oh, just the tavern as a replacement. Rules and regs are new. Um, the sign on the building, the barn, which you're familiar with, is new. That's new. Okay. So again, fabrication, dimensional letter, flat background, raised molding, materials that last indefinitely finishes with a manufacturer's implied warranty of eight to 10 years, um, depends on the exposure. So if I have this right, this is a, a, a Eastern exposure. No, this is a Southern exposure. This will take somewhat of a beating. Um, it should hold up for at least eight years before that purple maybe chalks a bit. Um, these signs could also be waxed to extend the lifetime to 15 years. So I don't think that's a, a concern right now. Okay, so what looks like it's black and white to us is actually purple? It's a, a deep, deep purple, which is on the um, existing sign. So if you drove by, 
it's not overtly purple. Um, you know, purple has a tough connotation. It's not the first color you'd think of if you're trying to stay on the conservative side. But I would decide uh, to say, I would describe the color as an eggplant where it's probably, uh, if you had 10 parts, it would be four parts black, four parts mid gray, um, one part uh, burgundy and one part blue. And either way, it's their color, right? It's, it's right. their color, yeah. So it's a tertiary color or even further removed from a primary color. And again, um, if you take a look at the sign we recently installed, it, it's, it's there with gold. So the two colors that you see in this system, well, actually there's four colors. There's this uh, eggplant, which is the, um, the school's PMS color. There is white, which is the background. There is black, which is an accent, and also um, gold, which serves as an inset border on every sign. So like a for instance would be with a playing field sign, the gold that you see that's a uh, inset, there's a raised molding around the perimeter that's white. The gold is a quarter round piece that brings you back to the white field and then the playing fields, uh, that's a raised letter that's in that eggplant. So, you know, it's a fairly elaborate sign. Um, the only way they're able to really look at this sensibly is if we do everything at once. So we could cut every uh, piece, we could cut all the letters, we could spray it once and gain some um, relative, uh, cost effectiveness based on somewhat of a mass production. Now, if they came to us onesie twosies, um, a sign like the playing fields, it's probably worth about 3000 to 3,500 bucks. In this case, the price probably goes down to about 27 to $2,800. Likewise with the perimeter signs, you know, when they wanted the one tavern style sign, it was 16,000 and change. The price is now down to about 11,000. And it's not with us walking away saying, we made a fortune on this. It's with us walking away saying, we're happy we delivered a product at a reasonable cost. And we've made a reasonable margin without uh, uh, filling our pockets. We served our purpose. We designed a good sign system. We built something to last and we were cost effective in our efforts. Okay, Mike, um, I still didn't hear an answer to the uh, question. So, so the, the, the reason why they're here, um, a lot of the directory signs that they're proposing are exempt from uh, your sign regs under the recent uh, court case. It's really, the two things would be the replace the uh, new signs, which which have the school's logo along Bushy Hill and Sand Hill. That's that that's that's your limit. Um, the the others are not considered advertising signs, and therefore, like I said, are exempt from uh, the regulations. So the it's the, it's the new one on the corner that really pushes it, and the other additional one that that Lauren discussed. Okay, what's the one on the corner? Lauren, could you go back to the one on the wall? Yes. No, I thought there was There's nothing there now. No, um, I'm not sure if the wall was originally intended for identification or it just looks like a perfect uh, setting for identification. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's the other way. I think it's at the end. Oh, this is the, yep, this there you go. Yeah. So, a similar sign system locally would be Miss Porter's, which I did back in 1987. This is a nicer system. I've improved <laughs> now that I'm an old guy. 
<laughs> what what is the one down on, on further south? The furthest one south on uh, Route it, Ten. It's, it's identical to um, the main sign that's existing on uh, Bushy Hill. So it has a an ad an address on it. Uh, I'm sorry, I've I've miss. Uh, yeah, it has an address. No, that's the main sign. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Linda's correcting me. Yeah, those don't. It does not. And I'm very sorry about that. They do not. They don't have a, any redundancy except in the uh, name and the uh, method of fabrication. But there's no backlit logo. There is lighting contained in that cap that wash lights downward, but no outward lighting. All right. And the one that's on, uh, so that's, that's on um, Sand Hill, but... That's so it, just says, it just says the Ethel Walker School when you come up route right, 10. Right, you're talking about yeah, right the, there, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, sorry, there's no address. It's on 167, Kevin. Right by the tennis courts. Yeah. Right. So Mike said there's two signs we need to be concerned about. The rest are, are exempt from our <laughs> oversight. Is that no. correct? Did I hear that correctly or not, Mike? That's correct. That's correct, Bruce. And the two are labeled in this diagram as D and A. Uh, let me let me just go back just to confirm. Yes, I believe that's the two. That so even discussing. though B is du a duplicate of A, that's not in our purview. Nope. I'm I sorry. It was already D built. D a, a is existing. D I, D yeah, is it's new. totaled in the it gets totaled in the in the same. Yeah, so A is existing, B, C, and E match A except for the address. D is the one anomaly, and that's in the corner on the wall. Yeah, but Mike, which two are you telling us are our pure view? And we'll so D, ask the applicant uh, for his opinion next. Your opinion, okay. which two are we trying to rule on here? Yep, it's going to be uh, sign B that he's showing you right now. Okay. Sign sign D, which is the new one on the wall. Right. And I just have to confirm with uh, sign E whether that is a replacement or not. I'm just going to scroll through his drawings right now because that would be the only other one that 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 is. Um, I don't know, Lauren. Is is E an exact replacement? Or is that a new sign that's down by the uh, athletic fields? Okay, C, and this one is yeah. typical of B, C, and E. Right. Yeah. Is, right. is okay. E a replacement or is that new? Because that's uh, that was confusing on your yeah, submittal. Yeah, that one is new. Uh, S okay. and, yep, S is a replacement and, and T is the um, little informational one as far so, as- So yeah, E is new. But e. Okay, yep. so that, there's your, Bruce, there's your three, I'm sorry. So it's B, D, and E. Correct. Yes. And and C. Actually, is C. It's B, C, D, and E. Okay, those are wrong. So the only one that's a one-to-one -one replacement on the perimeter signs is A, the, the yeah. sign with the address. So and, B, B, D, and so, C, and E. And so it's a dimensional thing, right? And so how far over are we? If I may, hi, Linda Loriano, Artifact Signs. I'm the permit supervisor, um, Mike, and, and I'm sure he will have an answer. Uh, the reasoning is that uh, this is a multi, uh, there's uh, multiple parcels in, in the whole, um, the canvas. Um, as uh, Lauren stated, it's about 200 acres total. Um, the regulation states that in a residential zone, so Ethel Walker is unique because the use is in a residential zone where it's only allowed through a special exception. And Michael can correct me if I'm you know, incorrect, but the reason is that there is only one freestanding sign that's allowed per parcel. And there's three parcels. And now, and now um, because of the size of the parcel and the scale of the development, um, it made more sense to identify the parcel with multiple more tavern sign to identify the campus. So it's the magnitude yeah. of the parcel yeah. and the fact that visitors that come to the school right. 
especially new visitors that come from points afar um, have been getting very confused and we wanted to set kind of a regular identification around the perimeter. And, and also if, if an applicant with, with a unique situation like this, um, if it made more sense, uh, the commission may allow more than one freestanding sign um, according to the proposal and according to the development. That's the reasoning why we're here. So I have the pleasure of actually driving by this site every day on my way to work and then on my way home from work. And uh, I also have the pleasure of using this site as a practice And uh, and I agree in, in indoor facilities and outdoor facilities on the property, and it is woefully wacky, lacking in signage. And I probably spend about 20 minutes before each event that I do there directing people onto where to go. And these signs would be an amazing upgrade on the property. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions of commissioners? Mike, I didn't see any recommended. I didn't see any recommended uh, 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 um. so, so all I would say for for conditions should the uh, commission approve this is that an administrative zoning permits required for the installation of the signs. Okay. And that would be the the perimeter signs as we discussed, which are new. B, D, C, and E. Well, I think there are, to me, the argument makes sense that uh, these are really um, valuable signs and a situation where you've got, I don't know, 200 acres uh, isn't like a residential neighborhood. So, um, we could make a motion to approve this and that would let them go ahead with their signs. Is that correct, Mike? That is correct. So does anybody want to make a motion? I want to ask, you didn't include the community gardens in the signage? Uh, at this point, no. Okay. I, I could put it up for a suggestion. It's actually, um, I introduced our uh, salesperson to the faculty there. And since, not that I've lost touch, but I haven't watched the individual decisions. So I'd have to say that I would consult with her and have her go back for the uh, gardens if that was- uh, yeah, Isn't there a sign down there? I'm not sure what, it's just not consistent with your new plan here. Yeah. No, I feel like it's just like a big long piece of wood that says the Ethel Walker Gardens or something to that effect. Yeah, yeah I thought it was a community garden, but I, I don't remember what it said. Yeah, right. Some type of verbiage. There is a community garden um, to the field where the ballpark is. Um, so if you are uh, on Sand Hill Road um, looking at the ballpark field, it's to the left of it. There's a big right. community garden there. Right. Right, you know, no, it's just not included in your sign package to replace that one. That's all. Maybe it's too much money. Well, we could mention it. I'm sure they did have a budget. Okay, does someone want to attempt a motion? It, it seems to be Mike's night. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll give it a shot. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve application 21-13 uh, of the Ethel Walker School uh, owner Artifacts signs agent for the uh, for the approval of the sign plan for the following properties: 101 Sand Hill Road, 230 Bushy Hill Road, and 233 Bushy Hill Road, zoned R40, with the special uh, with the exception to approval subject to the following condition: that a administrative zoning permit is required for each uh, for the sign installations. Someone want a second? I'll second. Second by Kevin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? It carries six nothing. Thank you very much. I want, I want to leave you with this one thought. So after we uh, install the main sign that's there now, sign A, 
I went out at dusk time with my tripod and my camera, and I, I took a hundred or so shots, hoping that one or two might be good. <laughs> and I had a pretty good shot with a nice uh, uh, foliage see in the back, and I posted it on LinkedIn. And there was a very uh, a famous designer that reposted it, and her comment was, "How New England." <laughs> oh, good. Good. Okay, That's thank awesome. you. Can we uh, get our screen back? Thank okay. you. Yep. Okay. Um, next application is 2114 of Fei owner. Uh, Mike Long is the agent for a site plan amendment for concerning the release of deed restriction associated with the powder forest homes approval. Uh, the releases for the property located at 10 Bantry Road, Assessor's Map 12, Map 103, Lot 5, Zone CZ. Um, this is one of those we've talked about, I think, a couple of times we've actually released uh, some of these. But they were, they were an attempt to do affordable housing in the Potter Forest, and they were set aside at a price that was to be affordable by 80% of the median income in the area. But instead of deed restricting it the way the um, 830G statute does, um, it was constrained that the price uh, would have an escalation over some period of time and you couldn't sell it for anything more than that price escalation amount um, and it turns out that that is a uh, is a problem in the people trying to get sell their properties and get a mortgage. The banks don't like that uh, property value constraint. And as I said, we have we have released that in the past for for other people. There are six more anyway. This yeah, is why aren't we doing them all at once instead of one by one? The applicant's here, so maybe we listen to him. Well, we can. I think if we have the list, Mike, do you have the list of the other five? I, I, I do. How do I, how do I get uh, my picture on here? I don't know how to do that. We can hear you. You got to turn the lights on, Mike. Turn the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thank Mr. Gray. I appreciate that. There must be a, oh, here we go, I think. Yeah. There you go. All right. <laughs> There are there were fourteen of, of these lots initially back in uh, uh, two thousand and uh, five when this whole development got underway. Uh, there are six left uh, that have not been uh, released or otherwise changed. Uh, a lot of the property was sold by the initial developer to a new developer who bought out back in two thousand and twelve. Uh, six of them. Uh, anyway, we're down. We're down to six, I and mean, most of them are original owners. It gets worse as time goes on, and then folks start to look at other options for elderly housing than, than what they have, and they're up against this uh, this barrier that Dave spoke about. Uh, the, the properties are. Uh, give me the addresses. This is 10 Bantry Road. Uh, I don't know, I gotta remember which ones have disappeared. Uh, 12 Bantry Road is another one of them. Six Meeting House South and eight Meeting House South and two others. And the last two are seven and nine meeting house north. Those last uh, four are uh, attached houses. They're four room houses. Uh, the first two are standalone. Uh, the other uh, 12 are, are gone. You know, Nelson Construction bought them out when they bought some of the property or they've otherwise uh, been released by the commission uh, and the board of selectmen because they're involved also. 
Uh, and these are the only ones left, and they're all in the same boat. And, and I would suspect that over time you're going to you're going to see them all come in because it's the same problem, and it actually gets worse as time goes on. Okay, well, Kevin was, uh, was getting to the point that if we agree with the uh, with the release of these uh, of these of these conditions on the on the deeds then we should make a motion with all six properties on it, I think. What do you guys think? That makes sense. Makes sense to me too. Do you agree with the release of the deeds? That's the first thing that's important, release of the constraint. Well, I, I'm not clear on what that restraint is. I mean, I heard what you said and it's not obvious to me. I mean, it's a matter of record what the how what the purchase price was on this property. In my understanding that the, the sell, selling price is limited to some multiple of that. It's a multiple of the purchase price. An escalation uh, factor. And the escalation factor is not as high as reality or, or market experience. Is that the problem? It's the other way around. Well, well, depends on how you look at it. But yes. Uh, the, the the indexes for the real estate change in prices has been far lower than what the consumer price index is, which is what is in these uh, agreements. And, and in other words, uh, all of these houses uh, uh, can be sold uh, because it's not be, you know they, they do not violate the index in the price increase formula. That's that's not a problem. Uh, the problem is that if they're to be sold, they have to be sold with the restrictions still passed along with them, and buyers cannot get financing to buy the properties because of the restriction. Okay, I think I got it. <laughs> it's not the economics of it; it's the, just the existence of the of the provision that could have a, an effect in the future that mortgage. Uh, um, opportunities are affected by the existence of the okay got it yeah. also i guess i would think that if we've set a precedent with the others it'd be hard to argue to not do it for the remaining ones right yeah i think we agreed that we should do it for all of them yeah but anyway any other comments on the uh, understanding well, the situation well maybe michael i don't remember what was the agreement when you did it with the selectmen did they extract any favors from it or any payment for doing the, re the deed re um, removal? When, when um, the original developers sold 74 of the original 182 proposed lots to a new developer, the selectmen uh, negotiated with them uh, very heavily for several weeks uh, and ended up removing the restriction of, of over 55. That was one of the restrictions on these properties. They removed the 150 foot setback from roadways, which in this case was Strattonburg Road and Bushy Hill Road. And they removed this price restriction. Uh, and they, they accepted in return a donation from the uh, Nelson Construction Company of $7,000 per lot, uh, which Amortized over the 74 lots they were buying was a little less than a thousand dollars a lot. So they, they, they took money. The town took money. All right. And do you anticipate that same kind of deal this time when you go through, or do you think it's a different situation? I, I think it's a different situation because uh, that additional new requirement that say the five the seven thousand dollars per lot. Uh, is, is an added problem because any increase that folks have had uh, in the property value, uh, they lose this. They lose seven thousand dollars of it if it has to be paid uh, over, over to the town. So it after the, the selectmen will consider it after the zoning commission uh, board takes action, uh, and uh, I I don't. I wouldn't want to predict exactly what they're going to do, but I believe that they'll be amenable to wiping it off the books. Yeah, and I was just wondering if you have preliminary discussions with them. Um, all 
Okay, I mean, I'm in favor of it. I would just say that we do all six at once. Someone want to make a motion? Mike, you're up tonight. Well, uh, first and foremost, it's a bummer that the banks are pushing us to remove affordability measures, which is really unfortunate. Um, but given that we do have a history of doing this in the past, it seems reasonable. Um, and I would like to make a motion to approve application 21-14 of Faye Shea, owner, Mike Long, agent, for a site plan amendment for the concerning the release of a deed restriction associated with the Powder Forest Homes approval. The release is for the property located at 10 Bantry Road, Assessor's Map, E12 map 103 lot 005 zone CZ. And if we may also include 12 Bantry, six meeting house south, eight meeting house south, seven meeting house north, and nine meeting house north. Here a second. Second. Oh. <clears throat> Further discussion. Yeah, uh, Bruce? I, 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 I'm fully supportive of giving. Uh, the release to each of these property owners, dwellers, whatever they are. But I, I'm not enthusiastic about, without talking to any of the others, deciding tonight for them that they should have it released. Um, it requires so little effort on our part. Now we're, we have, you know, seven or eight more people familiar with the issue to knock these off as these people come up against it, I think is a better approach. Is there a cost associated? Is there a cost associated with these applications? We have two hundred and forty dollars each. Ouch! But for the benefit they're getting for it, I'm not sure they'd consider that a lot of money. But I don't want to speak for them. I don't want to speak for them at all. They're not here. They haven't said a word. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Yep. Any other comments on that? But Mike, if you're unwilling to amend your motion, I'm not going to vote no. <laughs> so that's how I feel. Well, okay. I was just wondering if Mike has any feel for that. Um, Which Mike? Uh, Mr. Long. <laughs> yes, I've spoken to all of these people, and, and, and they are all uh, desperate to have it go. They're just not selling right now, but they all will be in the near future. And they all have identical uh, issues, problems, and yes, they all want it to go away. Okay. Any more discussion? All right. We have a motion on the table. Second made. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Carry six nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay, now we have the fun. Um, we have a, uh, oh yeah, okay. Regulation update workshop. Mike, any comments on the sign regulations? You're muted. I'm sorry. Uh, just briefly, I know TJ is waiting to hear from us. Um, I discussed our proposed sign regulations with the uh, Main Street Partnership. And the number one feedback I heard from that group was um, internally lit signs that they prefer not to see internally lit signs in town. They, they, they talked about a lot of the quaintness of the existing signage, the regulations, what it creates. Um, there was an acknowledgement, though, of Route 44 is a little different. So um, the other thing that they, they pointed out uh, to business owners was in the prohibition on inflatables for signs. Um, they, they, they specifically wanted the ability to put up balloons, not with their logos or anything, but just balloons to draw people's attention because they felt that you know that's just it's, it's something to try to um, use as advertisement, but at the same time just you know it done tastefully. Um, so those were the two comments I heard. I have not heard from uh, Morgan over at the chamber yet, uh, so. That's where, that, that's all I have. Okay, good. All right, in the interest of time, let's move on to TJ. There he is, right in the center of my screen. Um, I think that after your presentation, 
uh, whenever it was in March, no, it was in May. Um, you made some requests um, and I think that some of the commission members have, uh, were, were politely listening to what you said and we're not discussing any of the, uh, the facts. And um, so I think we wanted to discuss with you the things that you asked for and not to have you think that we were in favor of everything you said. Um, so I think uh, any of the commissioners have comments on, on the presentation that, my, that uh, TJ made? Well, I'll, I'll start. I guess my thought was just not, I, I, I don't, I guess my view isn't a lot different than what you said, Dave, but what I was concerned about as a, for instance, is uh, TJ told us they are coming back to us soon, soon was the word, with the proposal for the uh, uh, changes to the master plan for the Northern development to accommodate the three items that he pointed out, well, four if you count parking as two items, and then the thing for the fire department, and then the, uh, I forget what the, the euphemism was that's used, but instead of the commercial building that was approved, uh, you know, for uh, some sort of retail or other use in the front to put in a 15, uh, an, uh, an apartment building that would have 15 single units in it. And I guess I, I don't wanna be, um, suggesting that I'm not supportive, I'm just trying to understand this clearly, that it's your intention, TJ, they're the, they're the firm's intention to come back to us. They're not waiting for us to give our thoughts or give any direction. They're working on this now, the designers, the whatever's, it's, a, it's in the works and you're coming back with it. And if we're not supportive, where does that leave us? Is a good question. Leave us all where we are. The, the, the what I said what the message was last time that we're coming in shortly for revisions to the north site, which right. includes exactly what you said, but in the scope and scheme of things, that's not a significant. I mean, that's what the market tells us to do, and that's what they're going to ask me to bring to you. And uh, those plans are down the road. The bigger discussion and the more we're very pleased that we're invited back to, to have to continue the discussion and to get your input. But we really think that the uh, 130 acre south site is a it's a tremendous town asset and it's a tremendous asset. And uh, we're interested in, in uh, if you share part of our vision or some of our vision as to that what we want to do there. I mean, that's that's the open discussion that we have. The others. We are going to bring your presentation, Bruce, although we're always interested in inputs that you have to that. Kevin, you got any comments? Well, I would comment that, you know, on uh, the 200 site, the old building site, um, and I don't remember exactly what you proposed, but if we could see, um, that, you know, you had more single family houses there, but I think that is a, a good opportunity site for something with affordable housing. So if the developer could put something in there that maybe isn't, uh, yeah, come to us what was the proposal that would use you know, tighter development using the, you know, the regulations that we have that would allow you to um, put houses a little closer and, and maybe make them more affordable. Um, to me, that would be a, a good use for that lot. I mean, that is such a great piece of property. I hate to see it entirely uh, residential but if it were going to be residential, I think it is a prime spot for affordable housing. The Silvermans are under are are doing a significant amount of uh, analysis and understand that the town wants some affordable housing. the The model that we had for discussion was uh, fifty single family houses for rent and fifty single family houses for sale, and uh, the affordable trying to work with the affordable issue to diversify our housing stock is something very much on their minds. Okay. Glad to hear that. Mike, do you have any comments or Ian? I still struggle with the, the retail constraint or the, the, the trouble, right? I, we, we've, 
We've had multiple applications of retail entities coming into town. It blows my mind. It's a beautiful building down there. How is no one renting that, right? And the fact that another one's not being built and now we're gonna build more apartments, is just, it's mind boggling. <clears throat> that the retail's not there, the demand's not there because, you know, other spaces have gone, you know, been vacant for very short periods of time. And I realize there's there's different traffic patterns and things, lots of market conditions, but I, I just worry that uh, not enough efforts being made in, in actually filling the retail. My yeah. clients are highly driven entrepreneurs. I share your mystification that it's not, that it's not there, but uh, I, I, they're trying. I mean, they, they spend a lot of dough trying to get that done. Yeah, and they built one, right? So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Diane, any comments? No, I, you know, I, I would second what Mike's saying. You know, um, as much as you know, they're lovely buildings, and and the affordable housing is certainly an issue that we are um, are looking at. Um, I, I don't, I don't understand the the lack of retail as well, especially, and this is purely just a feel, but it just seems like there's a, a kind of a sea change happening, like in the last year or so. There's just been a lot of development in Simsbury, which we hadn't really seen for a while. So I just wonder if maybe if we revisit that now with the current climate, if that might be something different. But, you know, this is just my my layman's opinion. At the least, we'll try to get some good information on it. I mean, it, right. it, the the Silvermans regard them as partners in town, not as uh, someone who's going to tell you what to do with this, the community. Great. Well, and. I, I, I don't believe I was at the meeting um, when TJ did the presentation, so I don't really have any follow-up comments. One of the things <laughs> that concerned me was not the uh, 18, was it 18 single family, 18 single, 50. one room apartments or one bedroom apartments, um, but the design of the Gambrel thing kind of looked to me like it was too high and too big to block off the view of the mountain and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'll agree with that. It was, it was, it should be, if we ever were going to do something different, it should be in the scale of the building that's already there, which was, you know, max two story looking. Um, but again, I would prefer it to be commercial. Uh, uh, TJ, have you surveyed the residents as far as, you know, I mean, the whole concept of this came out of you know community development and, and the old walkable neighborhoods that you know, people want to live where they can walk to, you know, an ice cream store, or, you know, anything. And have they expressed any desire for any kind of um, facility, you know, that they would like down there? You know, sandwich shop, whatever. Um, I can. Uh ask what the management company has to tell you on that. I can tell you that the uh, a significant amenity was it would not only a, a true urban pattern of sidewalks, but a, a walking trail of a mile around the whole perimeter of the thing. And it is very used uh, all the time by the residents. Well, let me add this because I I wanted to raise this earlier, but my, my, my concern is also along the lines of the form-based code was adopted some years ago. There was a lot of effort and a lot of money spent on it. And uh, I think we need to be careful about how much latitude we have to simply prove something that, that wasn't already sort of considered here. And that when you don't have to read a lot of it, but there's a lot of information there, but really right in the first paragraph, 1A, there's a description of what was expected on that South parcel. And I'll just take a moment to read it. It's only about two sentences, but it says that it's looking, encouraging, encourage the reuse of the South Hartford site and building for office, technology, healthcare, support services, while preserving where feasible the environmentally sensitive design of the overall site and with a mix of complementary uses, including housing, retail, offices, commercial services, civic uses and supporting long-term attractiveness for both employment and neighborhood uses. When I read that, I mean, it's there for you to look at too, but when I read that, 
I don't see how we can sit down and look at nothing but residential uses on that property and say it's consistent with our zoning. It's not. So I understand the TJ's client's perspective that the market is really where it is for residential. I get it. But our zoning, which has set out the expectations of people who came before us, or at least before some of us, that isn't what they had in mind. And so my thought is if that's really where the market is, and we're convinced we're never going to get anything in there but residential, I think that we need to revise as sort of the beginning of the process. We need to look at this regulation and decide how much latitude there is and to change it. If the market and social norms and things of, you know, the world has changed in the years since this was written, we need to get busy rewriting it before we start spending, having the, the owner spending a lot of money you know, with designers and, you know, people, you know, with the meter running engineers and all that stuff. Um, we need to have some better sense of what the boundaries are. And I, that, that also I'm suggesting, I would like to see some reinforcement for the market read that they're, that you, TJ, you're reporting to us. I mean, I don't doubt your word. I'm sure that you're relaying what you're hearing from your clients, but it doesn't, it's not, you You can hear my colleagues. It's not resonating well here. <laughs> you know, we're, I can't see us, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable going to the, you know, voters of Simsbury, the other residents and saying, well, we gave up the commitment to mixed use development on those two parcels because the owner said there was no market for it. I don't, I don't see that where we want to go and or where the, the owners want to go either. So um, I guess, again, my bigger thought is about the regulation and how much latitude there is and what the expectations are. And I'm belaboring this, but if the market and the world have changed since it was written, we need to get busy with re retooling our expectations and getting those expectations ac accurately reflected in the, in the regulations. I'm, I'm appreciative of your remarks, but uh, the regulation in itself is uh, self-changeable. It, and it's, uh, it was, you know, I participated in the, in the, the writing as a citizen, not as a, a, an attorney in it, but it clearly allows the board to modify the plan. Uh, it, it, what it really sets is the design capability and the census that you could develop on the site. But, uh, but every, everything you say is so Bruce. And, you know, right now, I think this board is, is as stable and balanced and fair as any board that I've ever been in town. So uh, we're here to uh, have this discussion. I do think that the existing Hartford form based code allows it to change, allows you to change it, uh, to be consistent in any manner that you want within the overall scope. It has to include those things. It excludes things that aren't on that list, but it doesn't set the dimension or the senses of what it's going to be inside it. But that should be a sound judgment of what you think the town can do, what the market will do, and what the rest will do. And you're saying put us to our proof and want us to come forward. That's a fair. That's a fair comment. That's well, I don't. I don't want to be mistaken here. I realize this is the zoning commission. We can amend our regulations, and and this is only one of many regulations that we could amend following public hearing and a normal process. Well, what I'm concerned about is that we want to all feel like we're moving in the right direction when we take up the notion of recognizing that the, the zoning regulation is not adequate to do what the current owner wants to do. Well, I, and if I may for a second, TJ, before you answer, um, this is a very interesting position you're taking because when we were looking at the original applications for the Northern property, you basically rolled in saying, this thing's a done deal. We already decided all this fun stuff. This is a go. You guys, there's nothing to discuss here. This thing is done, right? And now you're saying, oh, you guys can do whatever you want with it. So it's just an interesting change. The language that Bruce cited is exactly the same language that governed the North site. And what we said when we came in was, the development census and the capability of the lot has been established. And it was. There were parameters as to how much you could get and how much you could develop and how much uh, impervious coverage you could make. And they want, and that recognized that we had an opportunity there to create a separate place that would be a little different and a little denser. And that, so that's what, that's what was committed. And the specific design, Mike, was, 
was subject to the zoning commission's enactment. And that's all we're saying now. I'm not saying we're going to change the enabling zone. The Hartford form-based code stays unless you unless you rezone it to something else. But if it's a Hartford form-based code, in that code, it tells you exactly how to tune it up, tweak it, and change it. And that's what we would be th- seeking to do, to modify the Hartford form-based code. Those are discussions we've had with town, but all good questions. But back to the, the development, the nearing completion of uh, the northern site. If the uh, approved uh, building at the front that you're talking about now substituting a, uh, an apartment building for, if that's not built, then we have one vacant, much smaller building available for retail or office use or some other thing. And if next year you come back and say, well, that's not flying, we need to do something different there. We're going to have nothing but residential, you know, which is not the mixed use that people had in mind when this thing was undertaken. That's not mixed use, 99% residential, or, you know, I'm exaggerating, but there's no required balance, but there's an implied uh, notion in the words mixed use that there's going to be something more substantial in addition to these various forms of residential. That's my thing. The most salient comment to that is what you said, the world has changed. I mean, there was a true hope that, that there was a true hope that mixed youth could be very successful. You know, we'll see how they do in Avon Center. Uh, there are some things going on. I'm thrilled today with the new restaurants and the, anything new in Sims Ray that's coming. I think it's fabulous, but uh, uh, I think the hope of mixed use is in a community like ours is, is uh, we'll see how it does. Well, we've had we've had discussions uh, about two years ago now about the fact that the pad regulation was resulting in nothing but apartments, basically, and so we really need to look at our regulations as you and see whether or not this idea of mixed use um, makes any sense. Doesn't make sense if you got a nice picture. You paint a beautiful new urbanist picture of, of apartments on the second and third floor of this downtown thing. But if you can't finance it and you can't get people to invest in their in their businesses there, um, it, it's a pipe dream. So anyway. I'm in agreement. And my concern is that our regulations don't say that, that it's a pipe dream, you know? Well, it's- yeah, but remember, we started out. You, you get a lot of people coming together, none of whom have any money in the in the interest in the in the projects, and they come around and say, "What would we like here?" Well, it's good to have the community discuss what they'd like here, but in the absence of them coming up with money, that's a different thing. Uh, in Hartford, for example, the, the, the city is trying to re- revitalize downtown, but they're putting money into these developments. Great, I got it. And, and uh, TJ's clients are ready to put more money into Simsbury, but you know they wanna put in what they wanna put in. Right. And, and they're defining that as what the market supports or what the market's calling for, I guess. I, I just say one plug for my clients, they're long-term investors, they're not, they're not like most of the developers who find a great town, build an 80 unit apartment building and then sell it to people who will hold it as an investment. But, but the Silvermans are, are builders and holders and that's uh, that makes them a little different and it might make them a little more. It, I think you should recognize that, that they, that they're here for a long time. They're not here for a short time and they look at the long-term picture. Yeah, I think that's a great thing. I think that we've gotten the message across that we wanted to get across to TJ that that we'd like to discuss these things and from different aspects, um, both what it looks like, whether it's too big in the case of the the single or the uh, one bedroom apartments, and maybe with some affordable housing in the in the south parcel might make it more palatable to the community. 
So anyway, let's, I think we did get our message. Is there anything else that I've omitted here? Somebody would like to add? I, I just want to again say, you know, I thought this was, you know, that property was going to be visionary and that we were trying to do something different. And I would just like to see if there is still a possibility to do something different than we see elsewhere in Simsbury. And that's where we, you know, the new urbanism was kind of in the consideration when we when we created that code. Um, and I know on the North product property that I insisted that we at least have two different types of development there because the original reg only called for one. And so I, I know in the, in the South side, we actually called for more. So I'd have to look back at the reg to see, um, you know, we were definitely looking for more diversity in, this, in the 200 property, 200 uh, Hot Metal Street property than in the North. But um, I don't think we should just take the easy way out and say that this is what the market's calling for. I do think we need to look at, you know, what can we do that's unique with that property? Because, you know, that size property doesn't come along again. And uh, you don't want to just say, let's just build houses because that's what's easy to do right now. I'm the Silvermans are very appreciative of everything about the board. I will tell you that uh, left to their own devices and not hearing what they hear in the community, they wouldn't be working so hard trying to get a good uh, uh, affordable product that they yeah. can bring to town. Okay, anything more, Mike? I think we hit we hit everything. All right, motion to adjourn. Second by who? I'll second. Second by Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Pardon? I just was thanking TJ for coming in. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, it was, it's okay. helpful. Very helpful. And I'll be back. Aye. 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 Okay. We're adjourned. Aye. Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Yep.